Hello everyone, welcome to Learn Wireless Technology. In the previous tutorial, we saw the basic functions of RLC layer, the RLC architecture and its entities, and the data transfer in transparent and unacknowledged mode. This tutorial is the continuation to the previous one. Here we will discuss about the data transfer in acknowledged mode, which is a very important concept. We will also see the PDU structures in different RLC modes. So let's start. The Acknowledged Mode RLC Data Transfer Mode Acknowledged Mode or AM Mode is used for services that provides reliable transmission. This mode provides the reliability in transmission by offering functions such as error correction and retransmission. It enables the use of ACNAC feedback which is necessary for error sensitive signaling and data. So basically, Acknowledged Mode offers all the available RLC functions such as segmentation, concatenation, adding header, retransmission, and resegmentation at the transmitter side. And at the receiver side, it offers functions such as reordering, removal of header, SDU assembly, and sending of status PDUs. The Acknowledged Mode is used mostly for applications such as browsing or email which are TCP-based packet data services that requires reliability. Now the data transfer functionality in acknowledged mode works the same way as in unacknowledged mode, means the basic principle of in-sequence delivery of PDUs by the transmitter and the reordering and duplicate detection of received PDUs by the receiver works the same way in both the modes. But the acknowledged mode additionally provides retransmission functionality by sending status PDUs to the transmitter. In acknowledged mode, the transmitting entity prioritizes the transmission of control PDUs over data PDUs. It also prioritizes the retransmission of data PDUs over transmission of new PDUs. Now let's understand the acknowledged mode data transfer with an example like we saw for unacknowledged mode. These are the transmitting and receiving entities for the data transfer in acknowledged mode. So consider that the transmitting entity sends the PDUs numbered from 1 to 5 in sequence. And assume that the receiver receives PDUs 1, 2 and 4 while PDU 3 and 5 are missing. So the receiver shall start the reordering timer and wait for the missing PDUs to arrive. Now suppose in this case the missing PDUs does not arrive before the expiration of the timer. This will trigger the receiving entity to send status PDU containing the status report which indicates the peer entity about the missing PDUs. Basically the status report will contain NAC for PDU 3 and 5. Upon reception of the status PDU, the transmitter shall retransmit the missing PDUs 3 and 5. And when the PDU arrives at the receiver, it shall send the status report indicating the correct reception of PDUs. Now, it's not always necessary that the retransmission will trigger after receiving the status PDU. The HARC protocol can also interact with the RLC protocols to inform the transmitter about the missing PDUs and this could also be used for triggering the retransmission without waiting for the status PDU. Now let's discuss the procedure of triggering status PDU in acknowledged mode. The status PDU is triggered by the receiving acknowledged mode entity using polling procedure. As you know, the status PDU indicates the successful reception of PDUs as well as informs about the missing PDUs to the transmitter. So basically, the acknowledged mode entity at the receiving side sends status PDU to provide ACK or NAC of the RLC PDUs to its peer entity. The transmitter requests a status report from the receiver by setting a flag in the header of the last RLC data PDU transmitted within a transmission window. When a positive status report is received by the transmitter, it declares that all the PDUs are correctly received. Now the status PDU can be triggered by the receiver in two conditions. First is when polling is received from its peer entity, 
that is the transmitting side entity initiates the polling procedure as it sets the p field of the rlc pdu header to 1 and polls its peer receiving entity so basically the status pdu is triggered when the poll bit is set in a pdu sent from the transmitter entity you will understand this when we discuss the rlc pdu structure in coming slides the status PDU is also sent when a failure in reception of PDU is detected. That is the reordering timer expires which indicates a missing PDU at the receiver. Now the sending of status PDU is also controlled by a timer known as status prohibit timer. When the status prohibit timer is running, the status PDU is not sent. The timer avoids sending excessive number of status reports and ensures that the duplicate status PDUs are not sent unnecessarily. When a status PDU is sent, the status prohibit timer is restarted. So with such timer, the status reports cannot be transmitted more often than once per time interval as determined by the timer. So the transmitting acknowledged mode entity sets the poll bit to request the receiving entity to send status PDUs. Now the frequency of the poll bit is controlled by various parameters and events. So there are some conditions with which the transmitting entity sets the poll bit. Let's have a look at them. So a poll bit is set if the number of PDUs sent since the last status report is received exceeds the parameter poll PDU. Then a poll bit is included in a PDU if total bytes of the PDU sent since the last status report received exceeds the parameter poll byte. Now this trigger is important since variable size RLC PDUs are supported in LTE. In terms of timer, the polling bit is sent every T poll retransmit timer. If this timer expires and there are no PDUs to be sent in transmission or retransmission buffer, the transmitting entity resends the last PDU sent with poll bit set. And finally, if no new RLC PDUs can be transmitted due to window stalling, that is, no data is present in the buffer, then the poll bit is set in the ultimate PDU. So these are the list of conditions which triggers the polling at the transmitting entity. The parameters such as poll PDU, poll byte, poll retransmit timer, status prohibit timer, etc. are configured by the upper layer. Now, when the transmitting entity receives a NAC for a particular RLC PDU via a status report or HARC protocol, then the transmitter shall consider that PDU for retransmission if the sequence number of the PDU for which NAC was received falls within the transmission window. The retransmission continues until the maximum retransmission threshold is reached. If the RLC PDU to be retransmitted does not fit within the size of the PDU indicated by the lower layer at a specific transmission opportunity, then the RLC PDU can be segmented. And if the portion of the segmented RLC PDU still doesn't fit within the indicated PDU size, then the PDU portion can be further resegmented. When a new PDU segment is formed, only the data field of the original PDU is mapped to the new PDU segment and header field is set accordingly. The reordering and retransmission mechanisms for the segmented PDUs remains the same and status report is triggered for individual PDU segments. The delivery of PDUs is considered successful when all the segments have been received and acknowledged. The E node B commands the UE to either use RLC unacknowledged mode or acknowledged mode for signaling and data radio bearer using messages such as RRC connection setup and RRC connection reconfiguration. As can be seen in this RRC connection setup message example, it contains all the information pertaining to RLC mode configuration. Here the E node B commands the UV to use acknowledged mode in uplink and downlink. It contains the information elements which gives the value of parameters required for polling procedure such as poll PDU and poll byte, retransmission parameter such as max retransmission threshold 
and the timers such as pole retransmit timer, reordering timer and status prohibit timer. Now we will see the RLC PDU structure in different modes. Let's start with the transparent mode. This is the PDU structure of transparent mode RLC. As you can see, it contains only data and no header is included in the PDU. Next is the unacknowledged mode PDU, also referred as UMD PDU. This is a simple example of a UMD PDU with 5-bit sequence number. It consists of a header field and a data field. The header field consists of a sequence number field, that is SN field, which indicates the sequence number of the corresponding UMD PDU. The E field is the extension bit that holds one bit value, which indicates whether further data fields or header fields follow. The FI field gives framing information related to segmentation. It indicates whether an RLC SDU is segmented at the beginning of the data field or at the end of the data field. Now, an unacknowledged mode RLC entity can be configured to use either 5-bit sequence number or a 10-bit sequence number. So this is a UMD PDU with 10-bit sequence number. It consists of some additional reserved fields in the header represented by R1. Now, in these examples, the figure represents only one data field in the PDU. When there are more than one data field present in the PDU, then the PDU header needs to be extended. In such case, the E field and LI field are present for every data field element except for the last element. LI is the length indicator field which indicates the length in bytes of the corresponding data field element. There can be even number of length indicator fields as well as odd number of length indicator fields. In case of odd number of length indicator fields, padding bits are added that follows after the last LI field. And for even number of length indicator fields, no padding bits follow after the last LI field. Now let's look at the acknowledged mode RLC PDU. This is how an acknowledged mode PDU structure looks like. It consists of a data field and a PDU header. The DC field indicates whether the RLC PDU is a data PDU or a control PDU. The RF field is the resegmentation flag field, which indicates whether the RLC PDU is an AMD PDU or an AMD PDU segment. The P field contains the polling bit, which indicates whether or not the transmitting acknowledged mode entity requests for a status report from its peer receiving acknowledged mode entity. Each of these fields has a length of one bit. Remaining fields, that is framing information, extension, and sequence number field has the same purpose as in the unacknowledged mode. Now, similar to the unacknowledged mode, when multiple data fields are present in an acknowledged mode PDU to be transmitted, the E field and LI field, that is length indicator fields, are present for every data fields, except for the last one. The length indicator fields can be odd numbered or even numbered, where in case of odd numbered fields, the padding bits are added after the last LI field. Now as you know that when a retransmission of PDU is requested by the receiving entity, due to any reason such as missing PDU detected at the receiver or a failure in PDU reception, then the PDU to be retransmitted might have to go through resegmentation, since the PDU may not fit within the size indicated by lower layer during that retransmission opportunity. So these resegmented PDUs also have a certain structure. So this is the structure of an acknowledged mode PDU segment. As you can see, the header has some additional fields as compared to normal acknowledged mode PDU. The LSF field, that is last segment flag, is of 1 bit length. It indicates whether the last byte of AMD PDU segment corresponds to the last byte of AMD PDU. The SO field, that is segment offset, is of 15 bit length, which indicates the position of the AMD PDU segment within the original AMD PDU. The remaining fields in the AMD PDU segment are same as the original AMD PDU.
Now coming to the last PDU format which is for the status report. Status PDU as you know is used to send acknowledgements for the received PDUs. So this is how the status PDU looks like. It consists of a payload and RLC control PDU header. The PDU header consists of DC field and CPT field. The DC field indicates whether the PDU is a control PDU or a data PDU. In this case, the DC field is set to 1 to indicate control PDU. The CPT field indicates the type of RLC control PDU. It is set to 000 in this case to indicate status PDU. The ACK SN field indicates the sequence number of the next not received RLC PDU which is not reported as missing in status PDU. The NAC SN indicates the sequence number of AMD PDU that has been detected as lost at the receiving side. The length of ACK SN and NAC SN fields are of 10 bits each. The SO start field indicates the position of first byte of AMD PDU segment within the data field of AMD PDU. And the SO end field indicates the position of last byte of AMD PDU segment within the data field of AMD PDU. Both SO start and SO end field are of 15 bits length. So with this we come to the end of this brief tutorial on RLC layer functions. I hope you understood the main functions of RLC layer, different data transfer modes, triggering of status PDU and the PDU structures in different modes. Thanks for watching.